Well, if you're just joining us, we are continuing in our Finding Clarity series. A few weeks ago, we started this series with the hopes of answering some frequently asked questions about um, questions or or topics in the Christian life uh, that we could talk a little bit more about. And the first week, we talked about what does it mean to follow Jesus today? I mean, if the Great Commission still stands to be and make disciples of Jesus among all nations, what does that practically look like for you and I here today? Uh, That's what we kicked off the series talking about. And as we've made our way through the series, we've discussed things like, why and how should I trust the Bible? Or what does it look like to share the message of Jesus with people around me. And even last week, uh, our lead pastor, Mike Mantooth, was able to talk about what's the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives here today. And what I want to talk about today is no simple task. It's uh, what happens when we die? Uh, What does the Bible have to say about heaven and hell? Now, I recognize that as we venture into this topic, it can be a bit sensitive. Uh, Whether you have recently or not so recently lost a loved one, um, thinking about what happens after we die can be a bit of an open or sore wound that we carry with us no matter how much time has passed. And I want to be sensitive to that, understanding that this is a very real thing that you and I uh, really wrestle with and we have going on in our lives. While also at the same time, we have to recognize that scripture and And more specifically, Jesus talked a lot about what happens after we die. So what we're going to do today is explore what the Bible has to say about heaven and hell. Now, there's a lot of questions that can come up as we're exploring this topic. So I just want to hopefully answer three simple questions. That's right, simple. It's going to be quick and easy. In and out in five minutes, promise. Just kidding. Uh, But the three simple questions, if you're taking notes, is this. First, what happens when we die? So when our heart stops stops beating, when we breathe our last breath, what what exactly happens after that? Uh, Second, I want to talk about what is hell and what is hell like? And then finally, and third, I would like to talk about what is heaven like? Now, I know there's probably a lot more questions that you may have, but these are just the three that we're going to focus on today. So as we continue on in this message, I want to anchor us in just one scripture passage, but we're going to reference a number of other scripture uh, scripture passages as we continue on. But if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 16. In this context, Jesus is talking a lot with his disciples. He's even having some back and forth with the Pharisees. And in Luke chapter 16, we read of a story that Jesus tells uh, about a rich man and a man named Lazarus. Uh, It's Luke chapter 16, and the story starts in verse 19. I'll be reading from the NIV translation, and this is what Jesus says. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate, or at the outer part of his house, was laid a beggar named Lazarus who was covered with sores. And Lazarus longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores." So we're introduced to these two people, and Jesus sets the stage for what's about to happen next. In verse 22, we read that the time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, or some translations say Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So the rich man called to Abraham and said, Father Abraham, have compassion or have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. 
The rich man answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not come also to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and they have the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead would go to them, then surely they would listen and they would repent. But Father Abraham said, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Let's pray. Father, uh, we just come to you and we ask for your guidance and your help. Would you illuminate and bring clarity uh, to these questions that we have here set before us today? I pray that you would soften our hearts and help us to see the things that you want us to see. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, let's start with the first question. So what exactly happens after we die? Well, simply put, we have to approach the throne of God and we experience judgment where we give an account for our life of what we did on earth. Hebrews 9 verses 27 through 28 puts it like this. Just as people are destined to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear again a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting from him, waiting for him. And as we read in the rich man and Lazarus, once the rich man and Lazarus died, they were sent to their respective destinies. But we get an important note in verse 23 when we read that it's in Hades where the rich man specifically was in torment. Oftentimes, sometimes this word can be translated as hell, but the word Hades in the Greek just simply means grave or the place of the dead. In the Hebrew, the Hebrew equivalent is Sheol. So in the Old Testament, it's written in Hebrew, some Aramaic, New Testament's written in Greek. The same word or translation is Hades or Sheol, and it means grave or place of the dead. All throughout the Bible, Sheol or Hades was known to be the place where souls were kept until the final resurrection. And all throughout the Old Testament, about 65 times, we see that Sheol or Hades is described as a place where both the righteous and the unrighteous go. But as we read in Luke 16, we get a good image of what this place is like. On the one hand, maybe on the left, you have this place of torment. This is hell. This is the place where there's an eternal fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, And this is where the rich man is sent. Then we have a chasm or a gap, just like we read about, that there's a, a fixed place so that no one can cross over. Once you are judged, it is an eternal sentence. But on the right, you have the place of comfort. This is Abraham's bosom, uh, or possibly even paradise. Remember when Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, It's another word for heaven. It's the place where God is. So what's important to know about all this is that Hades, or Sheol, is meant to be a temporary place, sort of like an, an intermediate place, until Jesus returns again then the righteous will go to the new heaven and the new earth, and the unrighteous will go to the lake of fire to experience their eternal hell. Now, when I first uh, heard this, this was really confusing to me, because growing up, you know, I just heard that, you know, when you die, you you go to heaven or you go to hell, and in heaven, you know, or or in hell, bad things happen, and in heaven, you know, all great things happen. You're kind of like this spirit that's floating, and you're singing worship songs, and somebody's playing a harp of sorts, and I even remember uh, in uh, Sunday school, they taught us a song. It was, um, I had it go, it was like, It's a big, big house with lots and lots of room where you can play football and touchdown and you can see your old neighbor, Greg, that you didn't really know, but he was a Christian, so he's there too. And, you know, it's just, it was kind of this ethereal place. Um, But as I was reading the book Heaven by Randy Alcorn, he used an analogy that was really helpful for me understanding this concept. Listen to what he has to say. He says, suppose you lived in a homeless shelter in Miami. One day you find out that you just inherited a beautiful home fully furnished on a gorgeous hillside overlooking Santa Barbara, California. 
With the home comes a, a wonderful job doing something you've always loved to do. And not only that, but you'll also be near some close family members who moved from Miami many years ago. Uh, on your flight to Santa Barbara, you will actually change planes in the Dallas airport where you'll spend likely an afternoon. Some other family members and friends who you haven't seen in years, they're going to meet you in the Dallas airport and board the plane with you to Santa Barbara. Now, when the Miami ticket agent asks you, where are you heading? Would you say Dallas? No, you would say Santa Barbara because that's your final destination. If you mention Dallas at all, you would only say, I'm going to Santa Barbara by way of Dallas. He says all this to really boil it down to this main point. Listen to what he says, quote, similarly, the heaven Christians will go to when they die is the present heaven. It is a temporary dwelling place, a stop along the way to our final destination, which is the new earth. So with all that being said, this strikes so many questions of, well, what is this heaven? What is this new earth going to be like? And also, what is hell going to be like? What is the lake of fire and what does that have to do with all this? Well, this would probably be the time in the sermon when I stop and ask you, do you want some good news or do you want some bad news? But I'm more of a bad news first kind of person. So <laughs> let's just start there. So the second question I want to explore is this, what is hell like? If I were to give a definition for what hell is, it would be this. Hell is God honoring our decision for a life and identity apart from him. What's fascinating is that hell was actually not designed for humans. It was designed for the devil and his angels. God designed humanity for a relationship with him. But God honors our decision for a life and identity apart from him. Let's look at a few scripture passages. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, this is a familiar one to some of us, we read that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. God's heart is that all would turn from their wicked ways, from their sin, and come into an eternal relationship with him. But he understands that not everyone will make that decision. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus's words, when talking about the final judgment, he says that there will come a time when he will say to those on the left, to those who are unrighteous, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We see that this is prepared for, not for people, though people will go there, it's prepared for the enemy. Even finally, in Revelation chapter 20, we read that the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented there day and night forever and ever. Fast forward to verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, one of the forms of God's wrath that we see in our world today and in the New Testament is the, the way that God will sometimes give us over to our desires, especially in the book of Romans. In chapter one, Paul repeats this line, I believe it's two or three times, when he says, God gave them over to their desires. This is a form of God's wrath. What he means by this is that he is describing a, a type of divine judgment by withdrawing from his restraining grace. So there could come a time when God removes his conviction, when God removes his spirit and allows us to continue on on our hell-bent desires. And that is a terrifying thing to think about, that, that God would, would like essentially remove the guardrails and open it up so that we are free to pursue what it is that we are desiring. That is a form of God's wrath. As C.S. Lewis put in his book, The Great Divorce, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. Or to those whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Your will be done. 
Hell, all throughout the New Testament, is described in a variety of ways. It's known as a place of darkness, but also a place of fire. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But it's best understood in Luke chapter 16 as a place of agony or torment. And so we read this in the passage we just read. Let's go back and look at it again, specifically in verse 24. So the rich man called to Abraham and said, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony. More on this word in just a moment, but just a few quick observations. First, don't you find it a little bit strange that this, this rich man is like, hey, tell him to dip his finger in water and then put it on my tongue? Like, clearly he hasn't been through COVID or understands social distancing. Like, like that's kind of disgusting, you know? It's like, hey, tell him to dip his finger in some water and then just place it on my tongue. That's going to make everything better. It's kind of a strange, you know, thing to say, right? So, so what did the rich man mean by this? Well, there are basically two forms of thought. Uh, the first, I think, is less likely, though it's an, int- uh, it's an interesting note. The second is far more probable. Um, and let me explain basically two schools of thought. Uh, the first reason, possibly, that this rich man says, hey, tell Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, is because in Greek mythology, there was a river that ran through Hades called the River of Lethe. It was known as the, the River of Forgetfulness. And in Greek mythology, uh, the idea behind the River of Lethe is that if its uh, people drank the, the water, it would cause them to forget their past life, therefore making their punishment all the more bearable. So in one way, the rich man could be saying, hey, could he just give me a drop so that I could forget everything and that this this could just be so much more bearable? I think this is less likely the case, though it's an interesting thought, probably because Jesus is speaking primarily to a Jewish audience. He's speaking to Pharisees and disciples. And so the second form of thought is probably more likely The second form of thought is all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's presence is known as like water and how it quenches thirst. I think of Psalm 42, that classic psalm that says, as the deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for the living God. You know, have there ever been a time in your life where you were just thirsty for God's presence? You desired his closeness and his comfort and his nearness. Or even in John chapter four, when Jesus goes uh, to the well and he encounters the Samaritan woman. And at this well, you know, Jesus is like, hey, I have water that you know nothing about. If you keep coming to this well, you're gonna be thirsty again. But if you drink the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. And this woman is like, are you serious? Like, where is this water? Like, I'll take some, please, absolutely. And what Jesus was talking to is that there is a type of satisfaction and fulfillment, a, a, a sense of comfort and presence from Jesus from a relationship with him. And so since God has honored this rich man's decision for a life and identity apart from him, his uh, actual like tangible presence of God has been completely removed. And so this man could just be simply saying just one drop of God's presence would bring a sense of satisfaction to my soul. And that's what I deeply desire. I think that is definitely more likely But regardless, we can see that this man is in agony. He is in torment. And notice that his first request isn't to get out. You would think if you were in hell, the first thing you would say is like, Jesus, get me out of here, please. I don't want to be here. Instead, he asked for compassion and he asked for comfort. Like make this place a little bit more bearable for me. He doesn't ask to get out. He asks for comfort. And so, you know, as I was reading this through, I kept on picking up on this word in agony. You know, that word or torment comes up quite a bit. So I was doing, and this is the part of the message where it gets a little dry. Okay, no, you guys are too asleep for that one. You know, we were talking about water. Yeah, a little dry. But hang with me. Now you got it. You got it. I hear you. 
So uh, just hang with me on this because I think this is really important and shows that hell is not like a divine torture chamber. Some of us carry this mindset that like, you know, God is just exacting like this punishment where he is just torturing these people. Like he's the cause of it. But rather what we're going to see is that that may not exactly be the case. In verse 25, Abraham replies and says, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received his bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in, there's that word again, agony. The Greek word for agony here shows up four times in the New Testament, and it's used all four times by the author of Luke. It's used twice in this story in these two verses. The other two times show up in these places. The first being in Acts chapter, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 2 verse 48. This is the context of Mary losing her son Jesus at the temple because, again, that's just what happens to parents sometimes. You accidentally misplace your kids. So they go off, and three days later, they realize, oh, shoot, we left Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem. So they go back, and they get him, and they find him. And when Mary comes up to Jesus, she says, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been, same word, anxiously searching for you. We have been agonizing over you as we've been looking for you. It's the first time it shows up. The last time it shows up is in Acts chapter 20. The context of this chapter is that the church leaders of Ephesus meet with Paul as Paul is en route to Jerusalem. He explains to them that he has this call from God that he's going to go to Jerusalem and he doesn't know what's going to happen to him there. But he knows that hardships and trials await for him and they will likely never see him again. And it's this agonizing, sorrowful encounter that they have. And as Luke is describing the encounter that happened, he says in Acts 20 verse 38, What grieved the the church leaders in Ephesus the most was that they would never see his face again. And that word grieved is the same word as agonize. So all that to say, what we see Luke doing is that the, the torment or the agony that the person is ongoing is always connected to loss. Mary is in agony because she lost Jesus in Jerusalem. The church leaders are agonizing because they are losing Paul and will likely never see him again. And in the same way, the rich man is in agony because he has lost his identity, he's lost his possessions, and he has lost his life. I mean, who is he if he's not the rich man who has feast and has a wonderful house? I love how Randy Alcorn later on in his book on heaven paints it. He says, the best of life on earth is a glimpse of heaven and the worst of life on earth is a glimpse of hell. For Christians, this present life is the closest that we will come to hell. And for unbelievers, it is the closest they will come to heaven. He goes on later to say, consider this. God was so determined that he would rather go to hell on our behalf than to live in heaven without us. He wants so much, uh, he wants so, uh, he so much wants us not to go to hell that he paid a horrible price on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. And friends, this is the wonderful news that we get to share with you. So let me just ask, do you guys want some good news? Yeah, like, absolutely. You know, like, let's move on from this. Let's focus on heaven. What, what is that going to be like? And friends, I don't even think our imagination can do heaven justice. Like, when we are picturing life on the new earth, it is going to be amazing. I want to look at um, four different things that we catch on uh, in the book of Revelation that talk about the new earth. First, the new earth includes uh, renewal, everything will be remade or renewed. In Revelation 21 verse 1, we read, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And this is going to be absolutely wonderful. Everything is going to be remade. 
You know, we live in a town where there's a Fortune 500 company where some of you work, and they work specifically on cars and engines. And some of you love cars. In fact, it was making me think earlier, a couple of years ago, we had a, like, a, like a picnic here at the church. And some of you guys may remember this, but we had lined of like vintage restored cars. Some of, them, some of them you probably have in your garage right now, and they're just your pride and joy. Like you love this thing more than your marriage maybe, which I hope not, but like you just love it that much. And what's fascinating is some people love these vintage cars and they can see a car in the junkyard and it's like a 70 or a 60 something or other because I don't know anything about cars, but they can just see right through the rust and all the working problems and they're like, that's a good car. So they take it home and they start chipping away on it little by little and they start rebuffing and putting in new paint, new transmission, new engine. And before you know it, you, you would think it just just came off the auction floor. Like it is pristine. And in the same way, we get to look forward to the remaking or the renewal of our earth, but even more so of our bodies. Like Jesus would say that, or Paul would say that Jesus's resurrection is the first fruits of what is to come for us. And Jesus was living and walking and eating and having a good time with his disciples as he was commissioning them. And we too get to look forward to the new earth and the resurrection that is to come. Not only that, but we also read about the greatest family reunion that's going to be taking place. In chapter 21, verses 2 and 3, Uh, John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. You see, ever since the fall, there was a fracture, a divorce. Because prior to the fall, heaven and earth were united. God and humanity dwelled together. But with sin in the picture, it created a fracture, a divorce. And really since then, there can be these moments and these times and these pockets where we experience heaven on earth. But sometimes those moments and those places seem few and far between. And so you and I are longing for the day when God will reunite with his people and he will dwell on earth again, establishing his rule and reign. And as we read, even in First and Second Thessalonians, we have the promise that it won't be just God coming with him, but all those who have fallen asleep or have died in Christ as well. And we will be reunited with every single person that is in Christ, who we know and love and those that we don't know, but have heard all about. It's going to be a reunion between God and his people. Third, we find that there's going to be no more pain on this life. In verse four, we have this promise that God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no crying and no pain because the old order of things have passed away. And as I was reflecting on that, I was reflecting on all the different things that happen in our life that just cause us grief. And I'm reminded that no pain in the new heaven and the new earth means that there's going to be no more chronic illnesses, no more aching joints, no more surgeries. No tears means there's going to be no depression, no fear, no anxiety or worry no stress, no misunderstanding, no relational conflicts or awkward air between people. There will be no more emergency rooms, no more intensive care units, no more chemotherapies. There's not going to be any more pharmacies, no more children's hospitals, and no more funeral homes. There won't be a need for any security guards, and we won't need any grief counselors. And we won't need any tax forms, insurances, or 401ks. Can I get an amen? All that to say, you and I, 
I don't even have to say anything. You have this deep sense in your gut, in your soul, that you know things are not right. And I know that for each one of us, we all are struggling with something. And it's hard. But we have the living hope. We can take hold of the promise here today that what is seen now is temporary. But what is coming is eternal. It's forever. And when God establishes his rule and reign here on earth, as it is in heaven, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more grieving, and no more death. And that is a wonderful promise to look forward to. And then finally, um, there's one more promise that at least I can see. Again, our holy imagination, there could be so many things that I haven't even scratched the surface with. But the last thing I want to look at is this. In the new earth, when we are reunited, we're going to be given a new assignment. In chapter 22, verse 3, we read that no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve God. The idea behind that meaning that you and I are still going to be working. Now, I want to remind you, work is not a result of the fall. You know, work isn't sinful. Rather, Adam and Eve were working in the Garden of Eden way before the fall. What makes work difficult is sin. So we have a fractured relationship with work. And so there are times when work stinks, for some of us who work maybe more manual labor jobs, like we ache. For some of you who are maybe working online and experiencing that like, like Zoom fatigue, like that is absolutely real. You know, like we have a complex relationship with work, but in the new heaven, in the new earth, we're still gonna be working just without any of the fractured relationship. We're not going to be aching and moaning and groaning. Like some of you are going to be really excited about this because we may have the opportunity to mow grass in the new heavens and the new earth. No need for that zero turn. You're just going to be pushing it itself because you are the zero turn. You're not going to be tired. You're just going to be going. Some of you will probably just take, you know, scissors and just clip it one grass blade at a time. And Jerry's going to walk by and you're going to say, hey, Jerry, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just going for a walk. What are you doing? just clipping the grass, I got all eternity, you know, whatever it might be. And for some of you, maybe you, you wish that God blessed you with the ability to cook, but he hasn't. And you long for the day when God restores that ability in your life and you're able to cook or bake in the new heaven and the new earth because it's going to be a feast. We're going to eat and drink and have fun and so we will be given a new assignment. We will still work, but the pain of work, the ache of work will be long gone. Friends, this is wonderful news. But the thing that makes heaven heaven isn't a place or a thing necessarily that we'll do. Heaven is all about a person. What makes heaven heaven is that God is there. And we can experience heaven on earth, though not in its fullness. But what makes heaven heaven is the fact that we'll be reunited with the person we are in relationship with, Jesus himself. And so as we close here today, I just want to implore you, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, uh, please come talk to us. Uh, one of the pastors or anyone on staff would be more than happy to talk with you. I mean, these things are fun to think about, um, but this is real life as well. And so our hope and our prayer is that as we have talked about heaven and hell and what happens after we die, we can have more clarity so that we can live life more efficiently here on earth. Whatever the days God has numbered us, we can love him and love the people that he's placed around us well. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word, uh, how your word gives us clarity um, on areas uh, maybe that we need clarity. And Lord, I know all too often we can live each day and each week just one right after the, the next. And we can kind of be in a flow and um, just kind of uh, drift in some ways and become complacent. 
But God, I pray that your word would sober us and that it would remind us of reality. Um, God, teach us to number our days so that we could gain a heart of wisdom as we live today, this week, and in the weeks to come. Lord, I pray uh, if we need to make things right in our life, that you would give us the courage to do that. Uh, if some of us need to maybe make a decision to accept you as our Lord and Savior, um, God, give us the conviction to do that. And for some of us who maybe are just struggling uh, with the hardships of life, would you give us your promises as an anchor that will hold us fast during the storms of life? We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you would like to talk to someone or have someone pray with you, we'd be more than happy to talk or pray with you. Um, know that as you are sent out this week, you are sent out with a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. You are sent out.